Tommy provided me this information. He said his father was born in 1914. And these are Tommy's words. If you had asked my father if one should steal, kill, cheat on his taxes, commit adultery, or lie, he would have said absolutely not. If you had asked him, why not? And his father would have said, because it's wrong. If you responded, says who? He would have said, God. If you said, where does God say it's wrong? He would have said, the Bible. If you ask for an explanation, how do you know it's true? He could not have given much of a defense of biblical authority. But in his worldview, like most of his generation, it was that of a Western or Judeo-Christian worldview. He connected all the dots of diversity within the unity of an infinite personal God who had spoken truly to all mankind through his word, the Bible, and had intersected man through the Bible's chief idea, the incarnation of God in his son, Jesus Christ. The God we speak of, actually, I'm glad to say, is the one mentioned right up there, in God we trust, because we used to. Tommy said, if you had said to any of that greatest generation, truth is something relative to what you want it to be, or there is no final truth, not only would there be wonderment at you, but anger. They would have seen you as a threat to their day. Wisdom to that generation and every generation of Americans before them was to know the truth and to follow the will of God as truth was not simply the way that was true, but the way that was best. Truth that carried them through the hardest century of our history. Now, that former view is seen as antiquated, as though greater minds have progressed beyond that. That former view is now seen as that which holds back the growth of society. But the belief in oughtness in moral truth is the marvelous byproduct of belief in the true God. It was Plato, Plato who said, in life we must seek the best opinions of men and hold to them as to a boat in a storm unless we have a more certain word from God. The idea of God, the Bible, Christ the Redeemer is the highest dream of the hopes of men. We can know what must be known to truly be mankind. Morality, marriage, the home, the dignity of man, the meaning of love, right and wrong, all are revealed on that which was the foundation of our civilization, the Bible. It brought a worldview which was light and salt to our culture and our country. It brought law and order and dignity. It served as a point of integration to which all answered. Our only problem was our refusal to live in keeping with it. But our day has cut off the limb upon which we were sitting in our rejection of God banning school prayer, permitting the murder of children in the womb, and abolishing traditional marriage. Modernism is the belief that God can be rejected and yet be replaced by the reasoning and science of man. Postmodernism is the recognition that modernism will not work. Because postmodernism states that there is no such thing as absolute truth, and with God refused, society as we have known it disintegrates. The earthquake beneath our feet began in the country shift in the 1960s. The tsunamis followed with each year more and more devastating. We are now worse than in the jungle. 
The jungle has natural law, which governs it, but the law that governs man is God. Man, as in God's image, chooses. He can be angelic or demonic based on those choices. Without God and his word to guide man, his fallen nature is unleashed. And unlike nature, man has become more and more immoral, violent, ignorant, and cruel. And that's the horror that is sweeping our country day by day. And as it has laid waste to Europe, it is about to eliminate the greatest culture in the history of mankind the Western culture, the Judeo-Christian worldview that sees all of life through the perspective of the God of the Bible, which we, the leaders of the United States as a body, have too often renounced. Washington's last words to us, George Washington's last words to us, were to be aware of following the path of Europe a path that began in the exaltation of reason and science in the Enlightenment. We have not heeded his words, and now Europe's inhumanities of the 20th century have become ours. I need not spend much time on the violence, contempt of authority, breakdown of the home, violence in our cities, decay of our educational system, the division of our leaders and citizens, pornography, STDs, 65 million dead through abortion, gender confusion, illegal immigration, drug addiction, opioids, loss of constitutional freedoms, the homeless, the increase of mental illnesses, pedophilia, gun control, racial tensions, not to speak of the economy and COVID. And yet in all this plethora of dysfunction, the terms God, righteousness, sin, repentance, Jesus Christ, the Bible, and salvation are forbidden terms. We cry over what ain't right and yet offer nothing but band-aids and tourniquets. Man must be changed. His heart must be changed at the deepest level. He must have a new birth. He must be born again as a child of God. He must, as Nineveh in the days of Jonah, repent and heed the warning of God that destruction awaits. Our country and its leaders must humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways that God may hear our prayer, forgive our sins, and heal our land. We must be reconciled to him who is our life and being. It starts with us, the God-ordained leaders, but sadly repentance cannot be legislated. It begins in revival. It begins in the yearning of individuals who have cast off the blinders of modern man and faced the truth that there can be no truth, right, love, or life without the unique personal God of the Bible. Tommy Nelson referenced quote from Alexis de Tocqueville. I want to provide some with thanks to William Federer's research and publication. There's much to be learned from Alexis de Tocqueville. He was born July 29, 1805. He was a French social scientist. He traveled the United States in 1831 and wrote a two-part work, Democracy in America, 1835 and then the second in 1840 which has been described as, quote, the most comprehensive and penetrating analysis of the relationship between character and society in America that has ever been written. In it, de Tocqueville said, Upon my arrival in the United States, the religious aspect of the country was the first thing that struck my attention. And the longer I stayed, the more I perceived the great political consequences resulting from this new state of things to which I was unaccustomed. In France, I'd almost always seen the spirit of religion and the spirit of freedom marching in opposite directions. But in America, I found they were intimately united and that they reigned in common over the same country. He also said they brought with them a form of Christianity, which I cannot 
better described than by styling it as a democratic and Republican religion. From the earliest settlement of the immigrants, politics and religion contracted with an alliance which has never been dissolved. That was Alexis de Tocqueville's note back in the 1800s. He said, religion in America must be regarded as the foremost of the political institutions of that country. For if it does not impart a taste for freedom, it facilitates the use of it. This opinion is not peculiar to a class of citizens or party, but it belongs to the whole nation. De Tocqueville says, the sects that exist in the United States, that's S-E-C-T-S, are innumerable. They all differ in respect to the worship which is due to the Creator, but they all agree in respect to the duties which are due from man to man. Each sect adores the deity in its own peculiar manner, but all sects preach the same moral law in the name of God. Moreover, as the sects of the United States are comprised within the great unity of Christianity, and Christian morality is everywhere the same. De Tocqueville also said, in the United States, the sovereign authority is religious. There's no country in the whole world where the Christian religion retains a greater influence than in America. And inserting parenthetically, that drove and led to the Civil War. There were so many people who were going, wait a minute, we can't treat brothers and sisters with chains and bondage. And yes, I understand some fault for states' rights. But let's face it, it was about slavery for most. De Tocqueville said in the United States, Religion is not confined to the manners, but it extends to the intelligence of the people. Christianity, therefore, reigns without obstacle by universal consent. He's talking about America. He said the Americans combine the notions of Christianity and of liberty so intimately in their minds that it is impossible to make them conceive the one without the other. And with them, in, this conviction does not spring from that barren, traditionary faith which seems to vegetate in the soul rather than to live. In book two of his Democracy in America, De Tocqueville wrote, Christianity has therefore retained a stronghold on the public mind in America. In the United States, Christianity itself is a fact so irresistibly established that no one undertakes either to attack or to defend it. Wow, things have changed. Tommy Nelson points out, remember the words of the athe atheist, John Paul Sartre. Without an infinite reference point by which all things are judged, all singular points are meaningless. Without God, all of life disintegrates. It's always amused me that in, in 1789, two historical events occurred simultaneously. The American Constitution in Philadelphia and the French Revolution in Paris, both representing opposite worldviews. The American Constitution, though not uniquely Christian, reflected the historic Christian worldview of, quote, nature's God and the, quote, inalienable right of life and liberty. It gave birth to a culture that France honored in their sending us the Statue of Liberty because of our country and being so successful. Not because of our revolution, but because of our Constitution. Revolutions are relatively easy. They're simply tearing down. What is difficult is rebuilding. 
The French had their revolution, but their replacement was not a document that reflected the Bible. It was a culture that reflected French enlightenment, atheism that replaced God with nature, science, and unaided reason. With no divine standard, it collapsed into a socialistic bloodbath that prompted a new term, guillotine. All of Europe would follow, and by 1848, the year of revolution, uh, all European monarchies were gone. But in France, without the God of truth, their replacement failed only to be conquered by dictator to bring order, Napoleon, who plunged Europe into darkness. And let me add, I agree with historians that have said the major difference between the U.S., the American Revolution, and the French Revolution was the American Revolution, like Tommy Nelson points out. It was about liberty that stemmed from biblical belief, whereas the French Revolution was about revenge, and we see how that worked out. But the same would happen in Russia, who exchanged the church for the communism of Marx and Lenin, and finally the horror of Stalin, tens of millions killed. Germany had Hitler, China had Mao, Cuba had Castro. But as a Russian pastor has said, Russia is a nation of darkness looking for the light. America is a country of the light searching for the darkness. Our search has sadly been successful. The Christian philosopher and author Francis Schaeffer said, where there is no absolute to govern society, society is absolute. There's nothing magic about democracy or government of the people, by the people, and for the people. It assumes that the majority of the voting public has the wisdom and character to place worthy men and women in places of authority. Should that society over time abandon their historic worldview and adopt a modern one where truth is shaped by individual opinions? Or should that society reject God and enthrone man? Then absolute divine law will erode with each generation until the tyranny of the majority removes the freedom enjoyed by the past. And considering the influence of modern media, the majority will be controlled by the few. And the America of history will be just that, past history. To abandon God is to disintegrate. Imagine, if you will, a great metal machine operated by man. The parts are sharp and pointed, moving with great speed and perfect synchronization. Anything that would get caught in the machine would be ground into nothingness within seconds. As long as the man's operating the machine is careful to stay outside of the machine, he's safe. But should he catch a shirt sleeve in the gears, he will soon disintegrate, such as man and the universe. And he stands unique in God's image outside of nature. Man can observe the machine, use it, and marvel at it. But should he become part of the impersonal, he is ground into mulch. Such is man and nature. Though part of the creation, man stands infinitely distinct from it as in the image of God. As distinct from the impersonal machine, man maintains his glory, but to be merely part of nature, all of the glory of man, mind, reason, conscience, soul, and will, merely become biological phenomenon. The loftiness and magic of man is lost in the machine of nature. King David wrote, when I consider the heavens and the works of thy hands, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Yet thou hast made him for a little while longer, a little while lower than the angels that dost crown him with glory and majesty and thou dost appoint him over the works of thy hands. And these are the hands that America has rejected. 
Man without God is a, comic, a cosmic orphan with no one who gives him meaning, care, or hope of redemption or life after death. There is no way, truth, or life without God. John 3.16 evaporates in that circumstance. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Man may act atheistic, wise, and secular, but he cannot react as an atheist. As soon as he is sinned against or done unjustly, he becomes a Puritan longing for an injustice to receive absolute retribution. Without God, the only thing man can feel guilty about is guilt. Guilt assumes transgression, and transgression assumes law that assumes God. Without God, there can be no final law, guilt, or true government, no civility to build a civilization, no cult or religious rules to build culture. We cannot legislate a return to truth. 150 years of governmental, academic, artistic, scientific, philosophic, moral, domestic, medical, education, and judicial denial cannot be naturally fixed. We are beyond hope for a return. We are too stubborn and too proud, too self-centered, too indulged. Our only hope is the divine reprieve of Nineveh in the day of Jonah. A prophet who rose from the dead promised life or destruction in 40 days upon their response to his prophecy of destruction. From the king to the people and even to the animals, a fast was called for and all were, wore sackcloth. The disaster was averted and so it is now. Prophets who rise from the dead after three days and nights are not to be disregarded. If indeed man has judged rightly for 20 centuries that there is an infinite and personal God who has revealed himself in the Bible, the foundation of history's greatest culture, who raised his son from the dead to offer man repentance and salvation. If he is indeed a God of wrath upon those countries who hold him in contempt, then our country revels today in the shadow of Vesuvius. Jeremiah 48, 42, Moab will be destroyed from being a people because he has magnified himself against the Lord. Icarus may fly high, with his wings of wax, but should hubris carry him too high, his wings will melt, his feathers fly to the wind, and he shall come to a violent end. May those who have ears to hear take heed, repent, reform accordingly, You know, Tommy Nelson has profound truth that he has provided. But that's because it comes from truth beyond him, which he radically acknowledges. You know, Dostoevsky was quoted by Solzhenitsyn. I had not seen the quote before Solzhenitsyn used it in the Gulag Archipelago. Dostoevsky was taking on the crazy ideas of this nut named Marx, a sad man, sad family, who couldn't even foresee the formation of unions. And Dostoevsky said the big problem with Marxism is not Economic, obviously that's a problem. They always go broke eventually. The problem with Marxism is atheism. And I hear some of my colleagues talk about how wonderful progressivism is, 
That's the new term for Marxism. How great it will be when everybody shares and shares alike. But as Khrushchev found when he set up a commission to come up with a plan of how you move to true communism, where there's no government, everybody shares and shares alike, he ended up disbanding the commission because there's no way to ever get to a place <laughs> until the Messiah comes, it won't happen because you've got to have a totalitarian government that takes away everybody's rights and tells them what they will be allowed to do and not do, and that government becomes the God. And that's what Dostoevsky was saying. So I won't be back next year. I'll be back in two weeks and the week after that, Mr. Speaker. But I continue to have hope that springs eternal in the human body.